Is it, is it quite a strange feeling when the hype of been dies down and you know that the manager will be looking at bringing in excess amount of new players, some of the players that have put in big, big shifts to get you guys to the Premier League may not get a chance to represent the club in the Premier League. Is that a worrying time as a player and as a professional? Not, not, not for, I, I, I can only speak on in terms of my mindset. It weren't, that, that wasn't a mindset for me. I was like, well, whoever he brings on, I've just got to, he ain't better than me. That was, yeah, yeah. and that was, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm, I'm, I'm being totally honest with you, that wasn't my mindset. So, oh, he signed that player. So, I was like, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm going to do. But then, it was a situation was if I didn't kind of perform or I didn't get my, I kind of went into a zone of like a dark place and it was, as I said, it was Achilles a heel, man. I was, I had my, 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 my eye outside of, of football. So it's a weird way of speak, speaking because maybe a lot of, not a lot of people get it. Um, but I didn't feel like football was going to be my calling. That even, makes sense. Even at this stage, even at this stage, you're still no. looking at no. things outside the game. No, because I got we, we we got promoted to the Premier League, and then after about the third third or fourth game, I scored two goals in four games, played against my boyhood team Arsenal, and I done my knee, and I was out for the season, and it got taken away from me, and that was like. That was heartbreaking, man. I had my wife crying, doctor telling me that I might not play again. Um, and it was, that was difficult, but kind of used that time, utilised that time to, we just bought like, we just went on a spending spree in terms of like buying properties. Because at that time, it was like 2007, it was like a recession hitting. We were just buying repos, me and my wife. And I was, you, you asked Sadie Booth where I was on crutches and we were going on viewings. I was on right move to find the property. I was, I was buying properties. And um, that's what I'm saying. Like football was one zone for me, but then real life was another zone for me. And it was, as I said, it was gift and a curse. It was a, it was a, it was a curse in the sense of like, I kept it too real and took, not the word too real, I just took risks that I shouldn't do because of my position. But then I took risk because of my position, if that makes sense. So I was, everyone goes, oh, you're, 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 you're supposed to be a, a role model in XYZ. And I'm like, I never really paid attention to that. I was like, okay, this is what I can do. Okay, I knew in my mind that a football career or any sort of athletic career was a short window earning capacity. So 10 years, 15 years, if you're lucky, of earning a good... But then you've got your life after that. And things that will happen to me or where I come from, I knew I was always close to the ground of reality, of paying bills, of not having such huge amounts of money. I was always close. So it was always new to myself. Well, I know a way to navigate out of it. So I took risk even when I was earning a lot of money because I was like, no, I can get back to that, whether it be football or whether it be not football. Does that make sense, James? It makes or sense. You're a bit no, Do you know what I mean? It makes a lot of sense. I'm just thinking yeah. of your mental health at this stage because you've gone from trying to aspire to get to the Premier League, you've got to the Premier League, you've scored against West Ham, you've then suffered a severe injury against Arsenal. Which uh, like against West Ham, Fulham, Reading, and then yeah, I was I was doing I was on I was literally I, I think I'll be honest with you I think if I had stayed fit I would have got comfortably fifteen goals that season plus that's how I was feeling after that injury and after that setback how was your mental health at this stage and did did you did you genuinely think that this could be the end of your career well I was told I was told by Doctor Stedman if you if you anybody knows um, he said. Um, your, your bones are rotting away and I wouldn't advise you to play again. I had my wife crying next to me and it was a situation where it was, 
I was like, well, okay, well, I need to, I'm, it's, I'm not accepting that. That was my mindset, I'm not accepting it. Um, and, but I'm going to utilize my time to see what, what other avenues are outside of football. So, as I said, we started buying repossessions where the doom and gloom was and we, we took advantage of the money that we were earning to, to invest into to a situation which could set me out into and my family out into a longer term. So, I, I, from somebody saying that to me, okay, well, your career might be over. I didn't go into depression mode. I went into my, my back's up against the wall. Let me zone out kind of mode. So... That was where my mindset was. How was your rehabilitation phase with your injury and getting back into the first team scenario at Watford? How did that play out and how did that transcend for you? I mean, look, everyone's different. Um, for me, it was just a case of getting fit because I knew what I can do as a player in terms of ability-wise. Um, but it was just making sure and reassuring. When a player has an injury, no matter how good they are, they need to reassure themselves that that part of their mechanism is working to the full, the fullest capacity. If it isn't, they need to manage it. Meaning, you get players like one of my good mates, that like Carton Cole. He had he had the same generic kind of knee situation as me from a young age. But then he knew how to manage his body physically and he knew to man how he managed himself mentally. So he might not be able to play three games a week. It might be two games a week. So you need to zone out and know, OK, don't try and overkill yourself and like wreck yourself. You need to know how to manage not just your mind, but your, your, your body also. So... When I got injured, and the, uh, I invested in a thing called a game ready machine. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. It's like a, you've got different parts of it. It's like an ice machine. You put it on, and it's different parts you start investing in yourself, just to kind of give yourself that longevity in terms of a playing career. And luckily, because a lot, a lot of players earlier on, so you might speak to Dubs, he might, Michael Duber, he might say, well, we didn't have that kind of it was coming in but later on like now you'll see the technology is totally different you know players get blood tested the temperature gets tested they can tell whether um you're not ready to train you're ready to train whether you're going to get an injury whether you're not going to get an injury how many kilometers you've done so it's all changed my mindset at that time was okay this is what the doctor is telling me i'm going to give myself every opportunity to rehab myself Stay disciplined and to get myself back onto a path where I can um, have a, a finish off my career decently, you know. Do you feel that you was the same player after that injury? Do you feel that you lost a yard of pace? Do you feel that you, you trusted your body as much as you did before the injury? No, do you know what? To be honest, um, it, it takes, you've got a window, James. You've got a window in terms of where you feel you are back to where you are. Because once you start scoring goals, especially as a striker, it, it doesn't really affect your, 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 your way of thinking to say, oh, no, I've slowed down. You're like, well, I know. It's, that's just a knack. You know how to score goals. And the buzz of scoring goals or being a midfielder that scores goals, you just know how to. And then what happens, what it does, it sharpens up your brain. So if your body slows down, your brain sharpens up. So I don't, need to, I don't need to do that much running or I don't need to do that or I might not need to train on Tuesday. I train on Thursday, have Wednesday off, go into the pool, get on the bike. So as these things happen to you, physically, mentally, you start educating yourself about your body. Whereas when you're younger, you take advantage of your physical aspects. It's like, no, I can, I can run, I can do this. Or I might be able to go out and have a drink and then I'll train the next day and whatever. you start take, you take advantage. As you get older and you get more injuries, you slow down um, physically, your capacity slows down. But mentally, you sharpen up. So you see players like Teddy Sheringham, 
you see people like that, Ryan Giggs, all these players that have had long, long careers, they're not as fast as they were 10 years, 15 years ago. But guess what? Their minds are just as... You can't buy experience and, and wisdom, you know? How, how much did you enjoy your time at Watford? It seems to me it was a big, big hub of your life and something that you really mm. loved your achievements. No, we loved, I loved it. I loved it. I, lo- I loved it. I loved everything about it. I loved the fans and um, in terms of just the togetherness and the, even the players now I speak to, like, we still have that bond. We, we still have that kind of, as much as people gone on different paths or whatever they're doing, we still, whenever we talk to each other, it's just that click, like, that's my brother, like, this, do you know what I mean? It's, when you achieve something like that, and the way we did, it's always that click. Now, there was a lot of speculation to what you would do after Watford, what your next move would mm-hmm. be. Um, I know Fulham were very interested in your signature for a long time with Roy Hodgson. Can you explain to us what what happened with that and, and how everything played out from your point of view? Right, so this is the original real version, not the media or anybody else's version. So I basically, we get to January, we are, I think, nine points clear, 11 points clear in the championship. Now, bear in mind, I've been told that um, I might not play again and I don't know how long my knee's going to last out, right? So, I'm in the Championship. I've always wanted to play in the Championship. I've got a taste of the... Sorry, the Premiership. I've got a taste of the Premiership and it was ripped away early doors, like after four or five games. So, I I got back to the, the drawing board Got back in the championship. I was top goal scorer, I think, by January, I think. And a um, couple offers come in. Now, Fulham were the front runners. So, I go to Fulham. Um, they agree, well, what they perceive to be a fee. I go and do a medical. I do a medical. They agree with Watford. Um, this is the time where AD turned up to my house. He said, I don't want you to go, but I understand and I respect your wishes to play in the Premiership. Well, he, um, he, turned up to, he turned up to your house like, to try he to turned up my, At midnight, at midnight. Wow. I'm in bed and my, my wife answered the door and he said, the gaffer's at the gate. Like, what do you want me to do? So I said, no, let him have a talk. We spoke for about three hours. He left my house about three o'clock in the morning. It was like, Kingy, look, we're on a good roll. And I said, Gaffer, look, at my knee, I'm not sure. I need to, I want to test myself. Like, I missed out a massive chunk. And maybe, you know, looking back at it now, it's like, do I feel like I let the Watford fans down or AD? Slightly, yeah, I do. But at the same time, when you've got a doctor telling you that you, you might not play again and you don't know how long your knee's going to last, and then that premiership opportunity comes along, it's kind of like, I need to, do you know what I mean? I need to, I need to test myself. So, um, he kind of said, oh, okay, look, we'll, we'll work out a way to, 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 to make this happen. Um, just stay away from the ground or whatever for a couple of days. I said, okay, no problem. And then, um, Fulham come in, bids accepted. And then I go to Fulham, go to London, I do like a 24-hour medical, been bent left, right and centre um, in Harley Street. Um, obviously, um, Muhammad al fayed at the time was the chairman, got his doctors, I was bent from pillar to post. Um, everything seemed okay and then I got a phone call from the Watford chairman said, no, Kingy, get yourself back in. They're trying to renege on the deal. Is saying about your knee, X, Y, Z. So they were saying basically they're not going to pay the money that agreed because of what they found on the scans on my knee. Now, it was well established that I already had an injury and what it was um, before they came in. So it was kind of like a business move. It was like, say, hey, someone says, we'll give you five million, knowing the history of that that person's body and then you dig 
get them in, you do the test, and now we're going to give you only three million. So that was kind of the the tug between the two. So um, he goes, no, come back in. I said, all right. He said, come back into training. So I said, all right. So I um, got a call, phone call from my agent. Says, no, Wigan. And I think oh, somebody else had offered the money. We went up there, discussed the fees, and then I ended up doing a medical, passing medical, and then signing for Wigan. How strenuous was the Wigan medical compared to the Fulham medical, in your opinion? Wigan, med- Wigan medical was done in two hours. The Fulham um, medical lasted about two days. Wow. So it was like... But it was my history of my knee in terms of them knowing that I just come off. Because I only played five months. I've uh, been banging goals and... Ch- they knew that I was out for the season when they, when Watford in the Premiership. They knew that history, so they agreed the fee initially with the chairman, which I understood. And then the chairman goes, "Nah, bugger that! You're not going to try and knock off a million or two, because now, sort of thing." And then that's what happened, and then I ended up going to to, to Wigan. For talk the me through that. Well, talk me through signing for Wigan that whole transition in your life and that period? It was weird. It was probably the weirdest period of, of, of my career in terms of experience going up north, north, um, and kind of accelerated me. Even though, I'll be honest with you, like even when I was at Watford, they looked after me and I, I was on a lot of money at Watford. Um, but that kind of escalated me into kind of the Manchester life and being in that circle. And it comes back to me in saying about being, um, com- getting comfortable. So I kind of la- lost the kind of, not hunger in the terms of like training, or whatever, but lost direction in terms of what it is that set me apart from scoring goals and just working my socks off kind of took my foot off the gas. And if even if you speak to my wife, she told you like that was a period that she, she was uncomfortable with because kind of put me into that kind of situation of that that whole bubble which wasn't me. So um I never really set it off. I didn't do well at Wigan and the fans will tell you that and they probably think that was expensive for no reason but um, it was a situation where it was a reality check really it was like things started to happen and it was I don't know it was it was a, it was a, it was a weird one for me because it was supposed to be like one of the biggest moves in my career but it wasn't it was kind of like one of the weirdest worst moves of my career not in terms of Wigan, because no disrespect to them, but in terms of me personally and my family. You scored what turned out to be your only goal for Wigan against Blackburn Rovers. Yeah. Yeah. What, why do you think you just didn't settle? What, what reasons do you put it down to? Like, where does it... Where, how do you put it from so many goals to then not producing? This comfortability, man. This is what I'm saying to James. It was, and this is what I want these youngsters to understand and anybody that's in that situation. That, not even in terms of football, but in terms of like any walks of life. Don't don't ever get too comfortable, man. Always keep yourself motivated and on your toes because I got to where I thought was the pinnacle for me. Big move, a lot of money, signing on fee, like getting bonuses, whether I played or I didn't play. And I just took my foot off the gas. And I became a person that just didn't... It, it, it was a recipe for a person that wasn't the person that delivered to get to that point where I was. Are you, if I'm being totally honest with you. Are you sort of at this age involved in lot in the club scene as well of Manchester? So the nightlife, the the whole going out of it? The, no, no the, not really. It was like more the lifestyle, living in Presbury and, um, you know, like, it was just, I don't know, it just felt, 
weird. Even for my wife, it just felt weird. Like it just, it just wasn't. It wasn't us. Um, and I didn't hit the ground running, so that didn't help. And obviously, they spent a lot of money and just kind of, kind of lost my way. To be fair, I was just like, ugh. just felt like a payday, man. It was just, it was just like my mindset was just. It weren't. I just weren't on it. If you want me to be totally honest with you, like. I just weren't on it. Like as I said, it's like I felt like I was I was probably in like silk pajamas, man. Like it's just, and that was this is what I like I said at the beginning. Like when you start feeling like that, you need to start making yourself uncomfortable in a positive way because you can spiral into a position where you take things for granted and it all goes tits up. So Premier League newcomers whole try to sign you on a permanent deal to come down and play for them. Um, terms couldn't be agreed for an exit. So I'm guessing you was on so much money at Wigan and Hull weren't willing to match that wage. Would that be right? And that they couldn't, a balance couldn't be worked out? I'm no, right. it weren't out. It, it weren't out. It weren't out. I'll be honest with you. It was basically, so Wigan wanted me to leave. Really? So I wanted to go into the next season to start a thread. Yeah, Wigan wanted me to leave. Not wanted me to leave, but they they wanted to like offload me. Steve Bruce wanted to offload me, and I was I was on a case of like, okay, I signed in January, didn't work out, scored one goal. I want to get my nut down because even in preseason, I was on fire in preseason for Wigan. I wanted to get my nut down and start fresh for the new season. You ask any player joining a team in January is very difficult because. To try and get up and running and catch up to speed with all your teammates or whatever. It's quite difficult. I'm not making any excuses. But I said, I want to get my head down. I want to prove myself at Wigan. And then I find out Wigan are like phoning all, all, all different clubs to get rid of me. So when I go, when they said, all right, you can go to Hull, I'm like, well, okay. But what's, what, what's the crack in terms of like, Oh no, we've we've kind of agreed a fee with Hull. They will pay us back the money that we paid for and match your wages. So I said no, but I've got to re up. I got to re uproot my family to sue that you don't want me after six months. Now, if I was a player and I wanted to move after six months and I signed a four four year contract, what are you going to say to me as a business as a, as an owner? What happens then? If a player says, I want to leave after six months, I'm not happy here. What happens? So I'm like, well, I've just moved my family to Manchester. Now we've got to move up to Yorkshire, up to, 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 um, to Yorkshire, further out. I've got to reset my, unset my family to suit you because you, don't want, you want to get rid of me. So I said, it's not happening. So I said, all right, you go on loan. And I went on loan. And then obviously... The rest is kind of history sort of thing, you know? When you was on loan at Hull, um, there was an incident where you were playing Arsenal, you weren't named in the starting lineup. Um, there was a little bit of handbags and stuff. Can yeah. you explain to us the situation and what went on from there? It weren't handbags. It was it basically, it started from James. I don't know if you remember the Man City game. Um, so we're doing fine from there. We're, we're, we're doing quite well. And um, the gaffer, Phil Brown, at the time, he's linked with England, I think um, Sunderland and Newcastle, which are his hometown clubs. I think, I think it's Newcastle. And we are, I think, third in the Prem, something like that. We beat Tottenham at Tottenham. We beat Arsenal at Arsenal. Um, we were, were flying up until like the January period. And um, he's linked to all sorts of clubs. And word has it, he, he was really vying to, to get back to, to either Tyne side or, 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 or where side. I don't, I'm not too sure which one it was. And uh, we were playing Man City at Man City. This time, Man City have got Bellamy, Rubinho, um, I think they got Adibayo, they got Island, but they, they, like they company, they just signed a whole load of players, and we're we're whole and we're on, we're, we're on a high, um, and we go into the game and Rubino's on fire, um, Island's on fire, 
Bellamy's on fire. We're like three 0 down at half time. So we go to walk in at half time, and um, the gaffer goes, "No, no, 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 no! Don't go into the change room. Come, let's go." So we thought that he was going to have a team talk with us and whatever. And he gets, he starts walking towards the supporters and he starts clapping supporters like. We're already humiliated because we're freeing them down. We want to get in the change room, regroup, and just like kind of back down on the gumption. He goes, right, guys, sit down, sit down, sit down in front of the fans. And he starts unleashing on us. So there's me, Georgie Botang, Gardner, Paul McShane, and Giovanni. Don't know what's going on because he can't speak English. And he's hammering us. And if you look at those pictures, and bully like Jimmy Bullard, right? Done the, probably the most quality celebration to take the piss out of what that scenario was, right? Nobody else could have done it but bully, right? And if you see my face, he starts hammering us in front of the crowd. So after that kind of situation, um, when we got to um, training, where we we he called us in for the Sunday. And he was like, well, boys, what do you think? You know, just like had a debrief. And then George Botan was like, Gaffer, you know, like, I'm just frustrated, but I don't think you should have done that. Then he asked me, he was like, what do you think? I said, Gaffer, I think that was shit. I told him, just like that. Because in my head, I've got no filter when I talk. So I said, Gaffer, I think that. I not asked any of the boys about me. I'll I tell, you, I tell you what it is. I said, Gaffer, that was shit. You can't be fucking hammering us Sorry, you can't be hammering us in front of like the crowd and stuff. And after that, we just he dropped me for like we was playing Arsenal. And bear in mind, I was top goal scorer. He dropped me like, and I knew it weren't for footballing reasons. It was for personal reasons. After that situation happened, and I just left the ground. I left the stage. Totally. Totally wrong for doing that. So I'm professional. Um, but, yeah, that that's... We never had a massive fall. It was just kind of... And then... That was that, was that to be honest. Do you think that had bearing on your on you being sort of your loan spell ending and then you going back out to Middlesbrough almost immediately? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, um, Wigan, Wigan wasn't an option for me. Um, that was made clear. And then obviously Gareth Southgate, who I've got so much time for, so much respect for. Um, it was like, for me, it was like seeing at the end of the season, I had other issues going on and it was like, this kind of wanted to kind of see the season out. I just wanted to, I wanted to kind of get away from football. And this is what I'm saying, like, with when people outside look at footballers, we're human beings, like, we have the same mental capacity. As much as anybody's, like, earning loads of money, we have the same kind of mindset in terms of being normal people and the, the, the separation in terms of the two. People might think, yeah, it's massive in terms of financial gains. Yeah, it's big. But in terms of mental, on the mental scale, it's exactly the same, if not worse, because you're dealing with your life in, in, in the whole public domain. So people say, oh, yeah, but you know, you've got all this. That doesn't s separate you from being human. Do you understand what I'm saying, James? It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, when people go, oh, if I was it, like, we can all say that. If I was until you are actually in that predicament and you're put in that position, it's very hard to, to be um, judgmental. So, I cut myself back in. Sorry. Where we are? Yeah, I know where we are. So, this would have taken us then. Sorry, excuse me. So, after this, am I right in thinking you would have returned back to Wigan, even though you've had all these issues with the club and everything that's gone on? You're then having to return back. Yeah, I went, yeah, I went, I went back to Wigan after my loan spell with Borough. And then obviously, um, in the summer, that's when I went to, to prison um, for a situation that was unfortunate and I had to deal with. 
Um, and that, that kind of ended a chapter in my life where it was, when I put it, I kind of took granted for that. Yeah, that I, I took granted of that period of my life. It was like I got to my, I got to where I wanted to get to. So now it was kind of like it, it, it is what it is kind of situation. That's where I was mentally, and I don't know. It's it, as I said to you before, James. It's weird because it's my mental capacity is was or I'll say this now was different um, back then because I thought well. I've already kind of made my plans and I've navigated myself out. So my mindset was already outside of football, if that made sense. I was ready, my mindset was already outside of football. So anything that came with it, I was like, and it was, I don't know, it's just a crazy mindset to have. And I don't encourage any young kids to follow my path in terms of that mindset. You have to always be hungry, always know when to switch off, when to switch it on and when to switch it off. We don't get taught like, well, I didn't get taught life skills coming into this whole bubble of being judged by people that I don't know. I, I wasn't prepared for that. I didn't, and that's not an excuse. I'm just telling you, like, we wasn't trained. There wasn't media training. There wasn't somebody to say, stay away from this circle, stay away from that circle, do this, do that. So if I can use this platform or, or free yourself or whatever to tell the kids, they need to navigate their way smartly, they need to make a plan. It's almost like a business plan of what scale they want to take them to and keep their mental belief all the way through it. But just always know that need to be switched on because there are snakes lurking and, and, and traps out there to, to kind of suck them in. So, I don't know. After your release from prison, old manager A.D. Bruford comes into your life again. He's invited you to come down and train with Coventry. Just how much of an important platform was that for you at that stage? Bearing in mind, I'm guessing your options and people were dropping yeah. out of life and stuff. So. How much of a how much of a viable option and how much of a lifeline footballing wise was that for you? I wouldn't I wouldn't say lifeline, but it's always important to have someone who believes in you. And AD, as I said, he's like a father figure. He's always that guy to understand the person instead of the persona. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Like he 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 he. he he, he didn't buy into the egos, the egotistical side of stuff. He didn't buy into that. He knew my heart. He knew what I could do. I had other, I had other options. But when he came calling, that was the only guy that I kind of trusted in to guide me back to kind of some sort of normality. It wasn't even so much about, well, just going back, playing for this club or playing because... I'm going to tell you now, when, when that happened, I had at least six clubs write me to say, we'll take you on. Um, but AD was like, look, I've got the Coventry job. I want you to come, want to settle down. He went, he met up with my wife, met up with like my kids and like my kids know his kids. Like it, it was just, okay, I felt, I felt comfortable. So, with that, with saying that, I had to make myself uncomfortable to making it up for the, the shit or the crap that I put my wife and these people through. That's why I think if I'd gone with somebody else, I think I would have fell out the game probably earlier on. Because I already, have, I'm telling you, Jen, I already had my investments and I'm not being big headed. I already had things where my family were comfortable and I'd already paid off my mortgages. I was, I was, at that point, it wasn't about football for me. It was trying to find somebody who could make me love the game again. So um, I felt like he, he gave me the sense of, you know what, you kind of owe it to your wife, your kids and whoever. That was his kind of 
approach to talking to me. Whereas in my head, I was like, I'm, I was done. I was done with the UK. Like, obviously, I live in Zambia now, but at that point, we had already made our path away from England and whatever. So I started to, because I went through like, not a hate period, but I went for a period where I was like, can't do this media thing. This is not me. I, I just, it's not my calling. I don't feel it. This is, as much as I want to kind of play the the Robin Hood kind of straight role, it's not, it just wasn't me, man. I was just, that was my upbringing to kind of self-destruct. That was my, my history. And I was trying to work out a way to manage who I was as a person. So I said to him, like, if, because he was like, I oh, know the chairman wants you to come in and we do a six week trial. I said, you know what, I'm going to come in, I'm going to train AD, I'm going to do it for you. And if we pop off, it pop, we pop off. And I went commentary, I trained for maybe eight weeks, played a few games, and it weren't until I think January. Mid January, I scored my first goal, but I still ended up scoring 15 goals that season, being top goal scorer, player of the season. Um, and, I, and at that time, they were saying to me, No, we're just going to give you six months, or we're going to give you a year. No, at first it was, We'll pay as you play. So you had, I had to, every game that I played, that's when it will pay me. So I had to swallow that. All right, cool. Playing, scoring. And then, um, Got to the end of the season now. Got player of the season. He was top goal scorer. I wanted to stay there. And then the chairman was like, um, we're going to give you a two-year with a year option. I want three years. No contract. I want, I want three straight years. I don't want no options. I've never done options in my whole life. I said, oh, yes. Um, but I will get back to you. I said, all right, cool. And then Alex, Malik, Alex McLeish was at Birmingham. He says, can you, we love you here at Birmingham. Um, what do you want? And he, they pretty much gave me what I want. And I went to Birmingham. There was quite, this caused quite a bit of a storm because there's the commentary fans thinking that they, you owe them. A.D. Boothroyd, obviously, that, that love and affiliation and trust kind of maybe felt a little mm-hmm. bit let down by you leaving what I, these are all obviously things that you've had to deal with and come to terms with but talk me through it from your point of view um i love my time at cov obviously they gave me an opportunity when i came out um and when i first signed for cov it was i was on like a trialist contract i was on a page i had to prove myself and then I, I, I let, because I was 30, I think 31 at the time. So I just saw it as kind of like my last contract in, foot, in football terms. So I said, I always state I want three years. And then um, the chairman said, no, we'll sort it out. We'll get you the three years. And then people, I'm, I'm in a roaring. Called the chairman. Um, he was like well, we'll give you the two-year and one-year option. I said, well, I, I don't really want to do the option. I want three years because this is the last kind of um, opportunity for me to earn like decent money before I kind of bail out of the game. So I want three years guaranteed money. And then they never got back to me. And then Birmingham came on and, and kind of blew the kind of whole narrative of the whole option and said, no, we'll give you three years. What do you want? And then I signed for Birmingham and then Alex McLeish ended up signing, um, going to Aston Villa and then Chris Hughes mm-hmm. came in and then I signed for Birmingham. So it wasn't even a thing that I wanted to leave Coventry. It was just, this is what I wanted because I had to, at the end of the day, I had to swallow like being on a kind of trial contract, kind of a pay-as-you-play contract to earn my way. So I finished top goal scorer, um, player this season, season and they had the opportunity to sign me which was understandable for longer during the whole season and they didn't they waited so 
if you check it, James, that's a business move, isn't it? So why as a player, why am I not going to have my business head on to say, so what only, only the business aspects works in a club's favour? It doesn't work like, for me, That it's never worked like that. It's no, I've never been kind of uh, uh, dictated by just a chairman saying, no, this is how we're going to, no. If it doesn't work for me, I've never ever signed an option. An option, I'll tell you now, only suits the club. Okay, when you hear a player sign three years with the year option, that option means after the three years, he might have, uh, uh, he'll have that option. If he's flying and he wants to leave on a free, he can't because they're going to take the option up. If he does shit and nobody don't want him, they're not going to take the option up. So that, that option doesn't suit the player. Okay, if a player has one year in his contract and he, then he does his cruise ship and he's out for nine months, he's not going to get a, another extended contract unless he's played for him for 10 years. He's not going to get that guaranteed um, contract because the club would just say, well, he was injured. Sorry, see you later. So for me, how I always looked at football was, and especially when I got to a certain age, was a business aspect. I'm going to treat you how you treat me. So I've come in, I've delivered the goods. Now this is what I want. The chairman spoke to him. He was on, he, I FaceTimed him. He was, on, he was on the beach somewhere in a pair of speedos riding his Muddy Fox mountain bike. And he was like, no, I'll get back to you. And he didn't get back to me. Birmingham, another club came in. I can't remember who it was. Palace or somebody else came in. And then, but Alex McLeish was like, no, Kingy, lad, tell me what you want. And I said, look, this is what I want. I want three years. This is the money I want. And went to his chair. said, right, we've got on the table. Went and done more medical and I signed for Berna. So there weren't no confusion in terms of like, I didn't want to play for I love commentary. Love the fans. Love the bond I had there. But then the business aspect didn't fit. And this is what players need to understand and start getting is that it's a short window earning capacity is very short okay it's like 10 if you're lucky 15 if you're really lucky of earning decent money now how do you invest it to the next 30 20 30 years of your life and if you don't put yourself and this is what i'm saying taking yourself out of comfortability yeah to invest into something that you don't know about you're going to be stuck in a bubble where you end up coaching. Not because you want to coach, because there's a lot of coaches that just coach because they love the game. But it's coaches that coach because they don't know what else to do. And that's, that's a total honest truth of you. And I've never been one of those guys. Do you know what I'm saying, James? No, I hear that. Uh, uh, so, it's, um, it's, it's horses for courses. So, I just made sure that when I got to the end of my window, when I was playing football, that I invested and that um, I, I, I knocked out what I could be cut to, to set me in a good stead for me to be the decision maker for my destiny going forward instead of me chasing something of what I should have taken care of when I had the opportunity. How did you initially settle in Birmingham? How did you find the area, the football, your teammates and everything that goes around signing for such a big club? Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. Blue, the, the, the blue noses are always part of uh, my journey. And they, listen, like some of the nights that we had in terms of like even going down to the den, I think maybe there was 2,000 blue noses at the den night games, we slapping them 6 0 at Mill. Um, you know, Europe, playing in Europe, just, and just like the, the people, it was like, it's just the bond that you have there. It's just super, super dope. Like, even when I talk to the supporters and like, that's a ground that I'll comfortably go back to any single time and just chill and sit in a stadium with the fans because they're just, they're as real as it gets, man. I love it. I love it there. You went on quite a prolific scoring run for Birmingham as well, scoring nine goals in, in as many games. What, what's it like when you're that hot as a striker? What, what 
do you, do you think to yourself, oh, I'm going to stick to this routine, or I'm not going to change my socks? Does anything like that go through your mind? Uh, yeah, you do get like little, you know what, saying that, James, you do get like stupid little habits, man, like, oh, I'm going to wear these boots, or I'm going to do up my laces this way, or I'm going to come out like last in the tunnel. You do get like things you start believing in things mentally. Like when you say like, I'm not going to change my socks and stuff like that. You be, it's crazy. Like certain guys have got like certain routines that they stick to. Um, and you will see it in the change room. It's weird. But if it works for them, it works for them. I mean, for me, like when I was scoring goals at um, Birmingham, when you're on that hot streak, you just feel like, I don't know, it's hard to really, at any level, like, even for you, if you're a striker, James, for a low league team or high league team, right? You score like nine goals in nine games. How would you feel? Let me put you on the spot. How would you feel? I'd, I'd be happy to score one goal in nine games, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone nine goals in nine games. That's like a season. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but yeah, yeah I, I'd be ecstatic. I'm quite a superstitious man anyway. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy and superstitious just making my cereal so I don't know like, <laughs> it's a difficult one for me to say because I haven't experienced it at that level I can only no it's the same it's like, the same the adulation of the fans and this and that no so, it's the same bro it's the same it's the same it's the same if you get a recipe that works it's very hard to change it so it's, it's the same like the fan aspect doesn't like kind of come into it you don't think like, oh, I'm going to wear these socks for the fans. You think like your first thought, first like point of call is I'm going to do that for me. Like, so this is what I'm asking. Like, what would you do if you banged in a goal and you had a, a, a pair of boots? If you ask somebody who plays Sunday League football, guarantee you'd be like, no, I'm wearing these boots. I scored last week in these boots. I'm wearing these boots, fam. You know what I mean? So it's, just, it, it's, it's the same on... Any different level, man. Unless you've got, like, fucking massive endorsements where you're like, oh, no, you've got to wear these boots because it's got silver in it and we're paying you loads of money or whatever, so. Again, you're getting older in your career at this stage. Is your body, are, are these knee, knee injuries and these niggles becoming more frequent? And, again, are you having, yeah. to, are you having to manage man manage your body and your training aspects a lot more? From early. From, from, from 25. From when I when I got injured at um, the Emirates, when I got injured at Arsenal, um, and my knee started flaking away. So basically, the what I had on my knee was like if you say you had a scab, say you cut your your elbow, right? You got a scab, and it starts scabbing every time I play football. You know, like if you pick the scab, say you pick the scab. So every time I was playing, like or even training, the scab was peeling away. So that, mu that, that scar tissue there that you had, that muscle tissue, was that every time I was playing, it was just, it was just wasting away. Like, like, oh, it's bleeding again. Oh, you know when you look at a heel, like, how come this ain't heel? This has been like six weeks. That was like the, in the internal side of my knee. And you speak to people like Carlton Cole, other players that have that um, generic kind of injury. Um, some have had to retire from like earlier than others. It's it, it's difficult. So you've got to start investing in yourself. Um, you got to you also got to start making managers understand that you can't imagine like you signing for a club and you saying to the, the gaffer like, "Oh gaffer, you know what? When I've signed, you signed on a three year contract, but I can only train on Tuesdays." Yeah. Like, you'd be like, "What? What? what have you just signed it? What? You? You what?" But yet you turn up on a Saturday and you bang in. You so that's the pressure that you put yourself like Gaffer. I can't train every day of the week. And then you've got this youngster coming up, say someone like Greenwood, who left right, bang, 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 bang. Like, Christ. Do you know what I mean? That's that's the sort of pressure it is when you've you have the I had it from twenty five, so I knew that I had to I had to try and get what I could out of the game, man. So sometimes I made decisions that a lot of supporters weren't happy with in terms of, like, even when I left Watford, I didn't leave there because I didn't love, I love that club. Like, that is that club that's the closest to my heart. But I had to leave there because I was told at that time that I might not play again. So my mindset,
looked at it was that like, got to take the opportunity. They might not get out of the championship, even though it was. And bear in mind, it was like nine or eleven points clear at that see at, at that time in the championship. I was like, no, I got, a, I got, a, I got a bounce, man. I got because my my name might collapse next year. So, what was going through your mind when Shanghai Shen Hu? Were linked with you from the Chinese League. Where are you getting this information from? Just, I just have my sources, man. I just have my sources. No, yeah, I'm bro. It's deep. It's deep. No, it's deep. Right, let me tell you this now. I'm going to be totally real. I was 32, 33. I was on 20 grand a week at Birmingham, right? And Shanghai Shenzhi come and said, we'll give you 50 grand net. A week because bear in mind at the time I was top goal scorer then I had a phone call this is weird I had a phone call from Dean Saunders at Wolves again right look um, we want to I had a year I had that and a year left he goes I want to give you two years he goes Kingy I was like who's it I, like he rang me like late it was like 11 he goes, oh, it's Saunders. So I said, oh, okay, you're right. He's like, yeah, Dean Saunders. So then it clicked. I was like, oh, Dean Saunders, Wolves manager. He was like, we know you've been linked to a couple of clubs. He goes, I know, like, were your club's rivals, but we'll give you, we'll give you another two years. Like, my eyes lit up. I thought, oh, I ain't got to go to China and eat that funny soups and stuff. And <laughs> so um, he was like, no. Nah. And because um, at that that time, Lee Clark and Birmingham said it was Nikola Zizic, um, Zizic was on about 70 grand a week. Ziggy weren't playing, bear in mind, we're in the championship, right? He had the same kind of length of contracts as me. I was on 20 grand a week. Ziggy had signed, they think, went for about six, seven million before the Carling Cup scored the goals. His money was increasing. So it was me and him that Birmingham had to get rid of because they were going through that transition in terms of like the finances wise. So Lee Clark was like, Kingy, I know you're scoring goals or whatever, but I have to release the financial pressure. So it's all right, cool. So he said, you can leave on a free. So it's all right. He said, we can't pay you up, but if you find a club that will get you more money, we'll let you go. So my agent's buzzing at the time because I'm top goal scorer. My agent's buzzing. So he gets clubs in, interested. He gets Shanghai Shenzhen. At the time, it was like China weren't... It was bubbling, but it wasn't bubbling like the yeah. money that he started throwing at the players. So they were like, no, if we're, if we're not paying anything for, for, for Marlon, we'll give him... Like XYZ, sign up, we'll, we'll pay him, we'll, we'll sign him a two year contract, 50 grand net. We'll give him a house, car for him, his missus, medical bills, everything. So I spoke to my missus, she was like, Well, we don't really know much, but we're going to go because the P's good, whatever. And you come to the contract. So um, the guy rings me, he's like, the chief exec rings me. The translator and we're on the coach I'm, I'm we're going to games at this time they're ringing me um okay so when can we meet so i said okay look i don't know now i need to speak to the manager see when i can get time off to have like a conference call um so um i think dean saunders at the time was at the time he was at wolves he calls me 10 11 o'clock at night say hey, kingy funny accent so Sondo. So I'm like, so I said, ah, oh, you're right, you're okay. He goes, yeah, it's Dean Saunders. Okay, so it clicked. He goes, no, I want you down at Wolves. He said, what, what do you want? So I told him. He goes, okay, we'll, we'll give you more than that next year. Come down tomorrow. That that was his words. No word of a lie. So going to I go into the gaffer's office on the Monday. Lee Clark I said, gaffer. You told me I can leave on a free. You want to release some financial pressures. Get. He said, oh, okay, no problem. Let me talk to the chairman. And because it was Chinese owners at the time. I don't know if you know if they're the same at Birmingham right now. I get a phone call. 
He says, um, he says, nah, Kingy, they want, um, they want a million pounds for you. I was like, Gaffer, come on. You just told me I can leave on a free. You just told me I can leave on a free. And this is why these, these clubs are interested because now they, they, they can't let you go for a free because of the scrutiny that they'll get from the fans. They're going to get bash from the fans, letting their top goal scorer go for nothing while we're struggling. So we need to get some income. I said, but you just told me I can go for a free. So I said, all right, cool. So I finished the season, finished the season, top goal scorer, Karen scoring goals. Then that's when it comes to the end of my second year. I had one year left and then they were like, no, we need you to leave. And I was like, well, when I had the chance to leave, you didn't leave, you didn't let me. So I'm not going to make it easy for you for me to go. So you're going to have to pay me up the whole year. They had to pay me up the whole year of my contract. Because at the end of the day, I was leaving to, to relieve some, some financial stresses. They told me, if you find a club, okay, that can pay you more, say more and more, get more years, you can go for nothing. As soon as I got clubs interested in doing that, that's when they, they, they switched it and said, no, we want a transfer fee. So I said, and then I said, so I carried on. They said, no, you can't go. Because, well, Wolves are our rival team. And because Wolves were, I think they were willing to pay like 500 grand or something. They wanted a million. Like, no, we can't let you to go to Wolves because they're our rivals. Um, so they messed me about. So when I got to the, the end of the season and they wanted me to leave, no, you know, we need to relieve a bit of pressure. I was like, no, nah, well, bollocks to you. you. You messed me about when you told, you put me in this position. I got, I got this in position. And then... You, you turn the tables on me now when it suits you. So you've got to understand when players do certain things, it's a business. If you're doing crap for your club, they're going to get rid of you. If you're doing well, they're going to want money for you. So if they want you to leave after they've signed you on a long-term contract, are you going to walk out of that contract? If, you, if, you're, if you're a bin man and you sign for a certain borough, and then they send you on a two-year contract like, oh, you're not sweeping the roads properly. We want you to bugger off. You're going to be like, well, I signed two years. Because guess what? If you wanted to walk out of that contract before the two years, there's going to be some sort of conversation had. It works in both hands. And this is what a lot of people don't understand, whether it be from a, a fan aspect or from a footballer's, a professional footballer's aspect. It's, this is a business at the end of the day. We love football, but it's the business aspect that comes in front of it that makes the whole thing tick. If I to pay you up, then does that then mean you were free Bosman to sign for Sheffield United? At that time, in my mind, I was retired. I was, I was to be fair, like that last year, because I was, I'll be honest with you, like my knees were shot to bits. Like it was like, um, I, the last three seasons, I was top goal scorer in the championship. Championship is a, such a tough, tough league, like game after game after game. I love it because of the excitement and what it offers you. And then when that happened, that year, it was kind of like me and my wife dis- decided, we, we already had our retirement plan in place way before any of this. So um, Lee Carsley is at Sheffield United. And then I've got a few other clubs. I've even got um, the Sheffield United manager called me. Um, come out, James. Chris Wilder. Who's that? Um, uh, Northampton. Kingy, come down. All the switches come down. Come down. So I was like, I was half going down there. I was like, because he, he's, he's a cockney like me. He was like, come. And then we'll just... Just come down to Northampton and they were like, oh, we'll offer you this. I was like, do you know what, to be fair, I think I'm done with football. I've been honest with you, I was like, I'm done. My wife's like, let's bounce. You already made our plans. Like, going into football, whatever. So, then I got a phone call from Lee Carsley. Cars, he was like, I want, I want you down here. Come down to Sheffield, just come down. Whatever, just, it's just all right. So, I go down to Sheffield United. And um, they were League One, massive crowd, great fans, great fans. 
massive club, wrong league, and it was just, you know what I mean, it was just, just like, I was on my way out of my career. It was, it was one of those things. Yeah. All right, cool. I'd like to speak to you a little bit about your experiences with Jamaica. Obviously, it's a huge honour yeah. to represent Jamaica in the international stage, one that no doubt you enjoyed. Can you talk to me about that experience? Because it's not something that we haven't really spoke that much about. Me and Jamaica, in terms of the the the, the national team, like that, that, it's a special place for me. Like there, there's, I speak about club football, but in terms of like playing for Jamaica, there's nothing like it. It's like it's a different experience. If you ask players like, like Jamie Lawrence, he'll tell you like it's. And the time that me and Jamie, Michael Hyde, Dion Burton were coming through, there's only like a sprinkle of three or four players. So there was that kind of separation in terms of the, the, the change room, in terms of like, oh, they're the English kind of Jamaicans and we're the Jamaicans kind of thing. Whereas now you've got like Wes Morgan, Mariapa, Jody McEnough, uh, McCleary. You've got like so many different players that now are volunteering to play for J Jamaica. And I feel like Fitzroy Simp Simpson, the Dion Burtons, the Marlon Kings, the, 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 the Jamie Lawrences, um, they kind of set a platform for UK-based players and European players to come and volunteer to play for Jamaica because there was that stigma as that our oh, training ground is dead, the food is too heavy, the flight is long, I'm telling you. So it was that kind of transition to try and encourage more English-based players to kind of come for Jamaica. But for me, my personal experience with Jamaica, it's been up and down like everywhere. That's just because of me. But in terms of like love and the love that I received back from the fans and the people, always love, man. It's always love. Must have been, like I said, a huge deal to be involved with that, especially the World Cup qualifying campaign, which I mean, back in Jamaica would have been a massive thing for everyone to even to, to, to be involved in it. It must be a huge, huge honour for yourself. Yeah, it was dope because at that time I was supposed to, there was a chance for me to play for Republic of Ireland. So it was like people like Clinton Morrison that were trying to get me to play for Republic of Ireland. And I couldn't, I couldn't really source. I knew my mum had like Irish parents, but because she was adopted, it was it was the delay and stuff. And then obviously Jamaica came up, and the state, the support that they showed me to kind of get my passport and my family and everything. It's just it was just all love from 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 the jump, and the majority of my family are Jamaican anyway. So it was like it was just a natural fit. I know you've had your retirement planned for a long time. You've been thinking about living in Zamunda for many years. <laughs> would you ever would you ever consider coming back to the UK and stuff? Is that something that you thought about? Yeah, look, I've got I've got homes there, I've got family there. Um me and my wife talk about it all the time. We've got kids that are growing up, teenagers now. So um we talk about it all the time. I think for kind of a short-term plan, it's not really in our plan, but for a long-term plan, for me and my wife, once our kids have kind of flown the nest, we'll probably, we'll, we'll flit. I think me and my wife are just going to travel the world and just, you know, after you've put in so much investment and time into these little runs, like it's time, you know what I mean? It's our time where, and I've seen like my wife's parents do it and a lot of other people do it where it's like, now we're going to go on a cruise and there's certain different things that we want to do. So, no, UK is not at, not at the window, man. Like, all my homes are there and flipping my banks are there. And stuff. So I've got the tax man still on my case. So I, 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 can't, I can't get away from it. That's my home. That's my heart. But in terms of like maximising what we enjoy as a family, it's not what we perceive to be beneficial for us at this time we like the sunshine we like to to have barbecues and just explore and go traveling get on the jet ski and the boats and just live life because you only get one shot at it man so you know if uk can offer me that 
then I'm I'm there. But right now, personally, can't. So. Good. Well, we've got a good bit of barbel fishing on the River Wandle. That's about it. That's <laughs> Jets. No, listen, boy, we love you. We love you, UK. You know what I love about UK? The oh. variety of food. That's one thing I miss when you can just, there'll be a strip of shops and you've got the Chinese, you've got Morley's, and then you've got the Indian shop. And then, you know what I'm saying? You just got the, and then you've got the betting shop. And then you've got maybe like a dude selling like mops and some bits and bobs and then some, somebody else with some books. We don't get that out of here, man. It's, 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 a, it's a totally different culture. But What I'd like to ask you is, I know it's hard as a, as a man to second-guess yourself and your own decisions, but if you could change anything footballing-wise about your journey, about your career, or maybe take back a decision that you've made, is there anything that springs to mind? Yeah, definitely. I think I, think I would have I I been more mentally open as a person, I think my upbringing taught me to be very guarded and, you know, like I, I came up through like a generation of like people that didn't really share emotions too much. And that was kind of like one of my Achilles heels, like just trying to be the I'm all right, lad, kind of kid. I know what I'm doing kind of thing instead of speaking and taking advice. So... In, in career-wise, no, because as much as I got into problems, I still managed to amass, I think, probably more than 500 professional league games and score nearly 200 like, like career goals. So I don't look at my career and go, no, you know, I should, people say, no, you should have played more Premier League games. In hindsight, I should have. But in reality, in terms of a person, I should have tapped into my mindset of understanding who I am more instead of me trying to appease others, if that makes sense. So um, for any youngster that might not have mum and dad at home, learning a way or speaking to somebody who can help them or navigate them away from potential self-destruction, self-destructing moments, can I say. Before the COVID-19 lockdown in the UK, we've seen knife crime, especially in particular in London, at an all-time high. From someone that's grown up in, in this part of London and has had that experience of living in the council estates, has had that experience of losing friends and seeing people who may not have had the right, made the right life choices, is there any advice or any, anything that you can see looking from the outside in that could help or change this situation? Yeah. Going on? Um, I think, James, in terms of like from when me and you, people like, um, have a, 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 a people of our generation or, or my generation, it was more of a community feel. I think if you, you need to be more mind, mindful of your capabilities, and I always talk about all this, about being more selfish and when i say about me more selfish i mean be more selfish in terms of what it is you want for yourself okay because at the end of the day if you if you're trying to appease others if you're trying to fit into a different environment right, you're going to find yourself not being a person you are and not being where you want to be so sometimes you have to or i'll say the majority of times you have to be selfish in a positive way to be able to affect others and affect the situation around you. When I was growing up with a knife crime and stuff like that, it wasn't projected in your face as much. It wasn't, it was like you'd have to buy like the South London Press or the Sun newspaper or it have to be really, really bad. Even though it was happening, for it to be in your face. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, you could... So you could trip up on the curb and you might be on Instagram or you might be on Twitter. So the generations change. But what you need to understand is when you are being uh, mindful of yourself and your mindset and what your capabilities are, are, don't feel upset when people are distancing themselves from you or they're angry at you 
for zoning out onto a situation or a goal or a target that you want to be. Hit that goal and then the rest will follow. Once you start diverting and you're trying to be this person and that person and this person, it won't work. You have to be selfish to be successful. So those are my words. I um, could tell you so many stories. I've been up, down, up, down. I'm 40 years old. I'm a director. I'm a company owner. I've got I own all my own properties, title deeds. Uh, you know, it's, it's a mindset. So understand who you are as a person, where you want to go, whoever you upset on your journey, as long as it's reasonable, do what you need to do. Be selfish to be successful. You can help others. So that's what I would say. Quite finally, how grateful are you for the opportunity that football has provided you? Whether that, be, whether that be financially, whether that be mentally, <coughs> whether that be just the stability and structure that it's given your life. How grateful are you for football? Massively. I, and when, when, when you ask that question... It's not a light question. It's, 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 it's a question that um, I'm sure all the ex-pros or current pros that you've interviewed will tell you, especially from a, a background of our ilk in terms of not having the path that's navigated for you constantly. When you've got different directions you go off in, it's very difficult. But football, you could have... And I'm sure, and this goes to any walk of life, you can have an argument with your missus. Now, go and play a five-a-side. How relevant would that argument with your missus be until you get back home and you stop playing football? Very valid point. Not, not relevant at all. You'd forget completely about it. So you've answered your own question. So that, in its sense, is not even just about football, but finding something that can take your way that can elevate your way from any negative kind of thoughts you have and this is what I'm saying about managing your mindset knowing who you are as a person what makes you tick what doesn't make you tick so you know what to stay away from and what you need to tap into listen Marlon I can't thank you enough for sharing your story no, bless you. I really appreciate bless you being you. open and honest and um, it's yeah, been a great, great pleasure to spend some time with you even via the, the Zoom link, it's been great. Yeah, man, we'll, we'll link up. When I get a flight, I'm trying to get a flight to the UK. Um, I've got a few things to sort out, but this whole COVID thing is just trying to mess things up. But once I get out of there, we'll just send me your, your number and we'll, we'll try and link up. And Yeah, no rush. When you're ready, it'd be great to spend some time with you in person. Like I say, I appreciate yourself no, making definitely. yourself available like this because... It's, it's, it's not the easiest thing to facilitate. So thank you very much, Marlon, for your time. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, man. Appreciate it, James, man. You're a real guy. Like, as I said, like, when I saw the people that you were interviewing, I just said, okay, this is a guy that I can kind of speak to. If these guys are speaking to you, then when I see Dubes and when I see Jamie Lawrence and all the other guys speaking to you, then those are the kind of real guys of football that you're speaking to. So... I knew straight away, like, there would be a connection. I appreciate it, man. Like I say, and I want to thank loads of my close friends that have made it possible for me to get some of the names that you've mentioned. It's like, yeah, it? yeah. you have to, everyone has to be put onto someone or everyone has yeah, to yeah. someone to meet someone. So thank you to my yeah, circle for, for helping me facilitate it, man. Now, pick up your circle, man. As I said, it's... it's it's all this, man, knowing how to work whatever you've got in your mental capacity, man. It's, it's huge. Appreciate it. You stay safe and we'll have a catch-up again real soon. Thank you for your time, Mark. No problem. Love, bro. Cheers, my brother. Thank you. Nice one.